That's right. We are about to go in when it comes to the economics of real estate. This is a topic that has fascinated me for the better part of a decade. And it's one of the few things that I really think sets this show apart. The listener base is really interested in this particular content and for good reason. I think that a lot of people got blindsided by the reality that no matter how good you are at your particular niche or your particular strategy, no matter how much margin of error you think you have, if the economics don't align with your investment thesis, you're probably going to lose money. And there's a lot of companies that made money for 100 years in a row and then lost a lot of money in 2008, maybe even some that got wiped out. We want to avoid that here on this show. So we have a great guest that definitely has been through it all, and he's an incredible thought leader when it comes to the economics of things, but he likes to make money. So it's very rare sometimes to have the combination of the knowledge of economics and the entrepreneurial sense and motivation to actually turn that knowledge into something that we can buy cool things with. So today, we're going to talk about how it's possible that there are many people out there that believe that despite the fact that there may be demand for U.S. dollars, there can still be inflation. This is a very interesting, somewhat dense economic discussion on this topic, but it is counterintuitive. There are not a lot of people that think like that, but there's certainly a justification for why that might be. We're going to talk about it today. And something that I like to ask everyone that I have a lot of respect for in terms of the economics of things, this is, in my opinion, a really important question. Are we headed for a Japanese-style deflationary period, or is this more of a 1970s-style inflationary period because of all the quantitative easing we've seen, not only in the United States, but all over the world? Really important question. It could impact your investment thesis and should, based on where you think we're going to go when it comes to that particular topic. Also, I was a little bit surprised that our guest actually believes that the oncoming correction, recession slash depression, whatever you want to call it, may be worse than 2009. And I kind of just gave away one of the secrets of this episode, but you know, I think we could actually do a whole episode just on that one topic. But he said it and he backs it up based on his personal perspective and Hopefully, we get into enough details so you can take away some of the justification for that claim. Now, some of you may know, if you're interested in this show, if you like the type of guests, the quality of the content, and the kind of topics that we cover, there is a live version of it going on in January. The Intelligent Investors Real Estate Conference, yes, we're doing it online this year due to the restrictions, especially in California, surrounding COVID, but... The content is going to be even more useful because of the timing in the market. For a lot of people's perspective, this is the moment that we've all been waiting for when there's some uncertainty in the marketplace, where people are hesitant, where there's some challenges, where there's some reasons for people not to buy. Now's the time to get the knowledge through the roof. doesn't mean that you're supposed to invest in every deal you see, but it does mean that there's probably not going to be a better time over the next 5, 10 years to learn and to invest in your own education. So we're creating a platform for that. And that platform is the Intelligent Investors Real Estate Conference. And you can check out tickets at IIREC2021.com. Of course, the slogan is Learn, Network, Invest. And so that network part is something that everyone's always trying to figure out in the online space. How can we create a real experience in terms of our online event? We're dedicated to that component. There's going to be significant networking where you can talk to people, you can be randomized and selected to match with different groups, and you can also select certain topics that you may be interested in. For example, I only want to learn about the mobile home park business. You know, metaphorically speaking, we'll create like a table type of environment. You can go to that table where the conversation is going to be focused on mobile home park. So I really do think. It's going to provide that level of experience and networking, and I'm sure you want to meet other listeners of this program. That's the vehicle, Intelligent Investors Real Estate Conference. Tickets are at IIREC2021.com, and I will see you there. All right, George. Well, thanks again for coming on. Really appreciate it. Hey, no problem. Thanks for having me. So I was referred to you by several listeners of the show, very much sympathetic to a lot of your thoughts on economics. 
And I was actually watching a couple videos about this topic, and I've been very confused about one thing, especially inflation. And one of the videos you had recently where you explained some kind of competing ideas when it comes to inflation. I'm very much excited about this conversation. But before we even jump into that, I want to hear a bit more about your background. And for those that aren't familiar with you, you know how you ended up coming around to your way of viewing the economy and the investment space and the capital markets as a whole. Okay. Well, I will try to summarize as quickly as I can here. I was an entrepreneur. Since I got out of college, I retired in 2012 at the ripe old age of 38. And when I retired, I knew zero about investing. (laughs) I knew nothing. I didn't know what a yield curve was. I didn't know anything about macro. I didn't know what the Fed was. People think that because you make a lot of money in business that you're automatically good in investing and maybe vice versa. And that sure is not the case, or at least it wasn't with me. So in 2012, when I kind of hung it up, I knew that I needed to invest my money wisely and get a a decent return, you know, maybe five, seven percent to make sure that I could live on the, the cash flow and I didn't have to go back to work for the rest of my life if I didn't want to. And I just wanted that freedom and flexibility. But I, I wanted to manage my own money, my own portfolio. I had no clue how to do it. And so the middle of 2012, I was in Singapore. I was at the Marina Bay Sands. And I had about 15 minutes to blow before a dinner date. So I was on YouTube, ironically enough, and I ran across the Free to Choose series with Milton Friedman. And uh, I, that just took me right down the rabbit hole. I, I, to this day, I love Milton Friedman. I love Thomas Sowell. And he was just able to articulate what had been in my head for so long, not just as an employer, but as an employee. And so from there, I went to Thomas Sowell, like I said. Then um, guys that kind of lean Austrian, like Jim Rogers, Jim Grant, Jim Rickards, Peter Schiff, Mark Faber, Doug Casey, Rick Rule. And then I started studying all the, the people in kind of the, the finance space, the guys who are more well-known like Buffett and Drucken Miller. And I just started to form my own ideas and try to figure out this game of macro. That's what always intrigued me because it's such a four, five, six-dimensional puzzle. And just trying to figure it out it, it was always just kind of an obsession from the day I stumbled across it in Singapore in 2012. A couple months later, I stumbled across, you know, when I'm still trying to just obsess and, and, and consume as much content as I can to learn about economics and investing. And at the time, I was just listening to every single audiobook and video on YouTube and podcast I could find with Jim Rogers, especially. He was definitely my favorite uh, for several different reasons. But uh, so, I, you know, I wanted to be like Jim Rogers and it just made sense. He, he always tells when he goes on CNBC, he's like, listen, it's not rocket science, just buy low, sell high. And I remember one time he was talking to Maria Bartiromo and she was trying to ask him this complex question about this and derivatives and interest rates. And he just, you know, in his Southern draw, he just says, Maria, didn't your mama ever tell you, you just buy low and sell high? (laughs) (laughs) It's just the simplicity of it was just genius. So I was trying to be Jim Rogers, buy low, sell high. I stumbled across a chart of real estate in the United States going back to 1900, adjusted for inflation, adjusted for size. And I don't know if you experienced much of the housing bust, but uh, it really kind of peaked out in 2006, bottomed out in 2012. And I saw that it kind of was bottoming out on its historic trend line. So I looked at the, the cash flows, I looked at the debt, and I said, wow, this is getting pretty darn cheap right here. And I compared it to Japan, 1990 to 2005, where their, their real estate market went down by about 60%. At the time, we were down about 50. So I figured we had about 10% downside, but the cash flow was so good that I'm like, you know, this is still cheap. So I went all in, in, in with real estate in the Midwest. I was buying up rental properties just in the real good neighborhoods, typically three bed, two bath, about 1,200 square feet. I was buying them from the bank for like 50 grand. And then I'd put about 25, 30 into it. And then I'd rent it out for 100. 
And that, or excuse me, a thousand bucks a month. That was basically my model. And when I got done, I had some built in equity, some forced appreciation because the comps were right around a hundred or so. So I'd have maybe 25 of uh, built in equity after I was done. And then I'd get that nice cash flow coming in with the rents. I did a variety of different homes, but that was kind of my, my bread and butter. And so I kind of learned the real estate game in the Midwest and I really liked it. I had a lot of fun doing it and I made a, a ton of money. So when I was an entrepreneur, I made a lot more money overseas, believe it or not, than I, than I made in the States. And so it was always just very, well, I never hesitated to go overseas to do business. I know that's out of a lot of people's comfort zone, but for me, it wasn't, it never was. So I, I said to myself, okay, I, I understand the game here. Maybe I can take overseas to increase my returns. So at the time, I now I've been in macro or studying it for maybe a year, let's say, and I thought that a lot of baby boomers would, would retire to South America because of inflation. I thought the CPI was understated. So to increase their purchasing power, I thought more and more baby boomers would move down to places like Colombia, Ecuador, Panama. So I started looking at real estate there on the coast. And long story short, I started really heavily investing in Colombia in Medellin in 2015 and we did a ton of deals there. I had a, a team that I brought up with me from Ecuador. And in 2019, we were doing, we, I had so much experience there and we were doing all these uh, remodels and I was keeping some in a rental portfolio, we were flipping others, but it's just like these shows you see on TV and in the States. And I thought, well, they were so popular in the States, why not just do one here in Medellin? And I, I st although I retired, I still had that entrepreneurial mindset where you just shoot first and ask questions later. So I went to the local station. I pitched them on the idea. They loved it. They said, you produce it. We'll put it on air. I said, fine. I had no clue how to produce a TV show. And they gave me about two weeks because when I went in there, I told them, oh, yeah, yeah, it's no problem. I can produce a TV show. Don't worry about it. And so they said, OK, in two weeks, come to a meeting with the executives and have a five minute clip of your vision. And then we'll either green light it or tell you to get lost. And so I had to figure out how to do a TV show in about two weeks. <laughs> so I cram, it's like cramming for a test. I'm just watching every single YouTube video and how to and all these uh, reality TV shows to try to reverse engineer what they're doing from an editing standpoint and storytelling. That's what it's all about. So anyway, we took the five minute piece. They loved it. We did a season there. It was fantastic. It was on a local station called Tela Medellin. The show was called Vida and Remodelacion. And it followed me, my designer, and my architect around with my projects. And at the end of the first season, I had all these editors and these camera people. And I said, man, these guys are great. I don't want to have them go work for someone else. So I, I want to keep them working for me. I want to leverage their skill set to make me more money in the future. So I'm like, well, between season one and two, I can just start a YouTube channel. And maybe I can do it on real estate. And uh Maybe, I don't know, maybe I can monetize it. Maybe I can make it work to at least cover payroll in between seasons. And so the initial videos were about real estate. I always preferred talking about macro. I've always been a real estate guy, but my passion is macro and economics. And so the first few videos, they didn't really do anything. And, you know, you get 10 views or something like that. But then when I started doing videos on macro, I was like, well, I really want to talk about this macro topic, but I know it doesn't fit the channel because the channel is supposed to be about real estate investing. But let me kind of just sneak it in there. And it turned out the macro videos were far more popular. So I just plugged away, kept at it. And that was about maybe a year ago, maybe a little over. And now the channel has 170,000 subscribers and gets 1.5 million views Per month, and uh, I guess the rest is history. Yeah, that's right. I, like I said, I checked out several of those videos and was like, okay, this is going to be a really interesting conversation. <laughs> and I got to tell you, I almost flipped my chair over. It's so funny that you said free to choose was a big moment for you because oh, yeah. despite the fact that it was much later, it was the same for me as well. Yeah. So I actually even went back and watched those, you know. Uh, probably 20 years after they're recorded. And that was the moment where I started to go down that path. And you mentioned many guys that I have a lot of respect for, a lot of whom have been on the show, Jim Rogers, Doug Casey. I'm sure you're a fan of Tom Woods, Robert Murphy. All these guys have been definitely oh, yeah. instrumental. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love Tom Woods. I love his show. I love Bob Murphy. I've been trying to get him on my show. So congratulations. Yeah, I, I'm a yeah, big fan. Yeah, yeah. 
always have to work, always have to send a bunch of emails and maybe even some videos. But um, yeah, yeah, it's been a lot of work, but very grateful for that. So let's talk about macro because I similarly share your views on macro is so interesting and compelling. If you don't understand the macro picture, it doesn't matter how good of a real estate entrepreneur you are, you can get wiped out if you don't know what's going on from a big picture. Yeah, so you see the great example. Yeah, exactly. So let's start this with, you know, a holistic, uh, a holistic view of, you know, going back to 2008, I want to get your view on quantitative easing and the dollar and why, what has happened since then in terms of the dollar status uh, is so interesting from a real estate entrepreneur's perspective as it relates to inflation. So your question, I, I think what you're asking is, is why haven't we seen hyperinflation when the Fed's balance sheet went from 800 billion to 4.5 trillion with three rounds of quantitative easing? Is yeah, that, basically anyone who is a proponent of some of those guys that we just mentioned, it doesn't yeah, seem Bob to Murphy. make- yeah. yeah, he got that wrong. Exactly. It's hard to understand how, okay, well, this is why we're proponents of sound money. Well, let's fire up the printing machine. Here comes an onslaught of inflation. What happened there? Does it time to just throw away free to choose and all these great books that you and I both love? Or what's the disconnect? The disconnect is the modern day banking system and how money is created. So let, let me back up here. You've got the Federal Reserve, when we say the Fed is printing money, it's a misnomer. They don't really, and I know they're not printing pieces of paper. I'm saying just creating dollars electronically or however you want to look at it. They create bank reserves. They don't create dollars. And I know they're denominated in dollars. People see them as one and the same, but, but they have different functionality. You can't exactly go down to a Costco with your bank reserves and buy you know, a case of water or something like that. It doesn't really work. They transact between banks and primary dealer banks that are under the Fed's umbrella. So if the Fed buys, let's say, a billion dollars worth of treasuries from uh, Goldman Sachs, they just credit their reserve account that is held at the Fed with a billion dollars of additional bank reserves. And the only thing that does is gives them additional balance, them meaning uh, the bank. So in this case, Goldman Sachs, or it, maybe it's better to think about Wells Fargo because they're more of a retail bank. The only thing it does for Wells Fargo is gives them more balance sheet capacity to increase lending if they so choose, you see? So there's a transfer mechanism. The Fed could print and, again, create bank reserves. They could create a quadrillion bank reserves. And if the commercial banking system doesn't take an action, it will never, ever result into any type of inflation, be it consumer price inflation or even asset inflation. What happened back in the, the GFC is the Fed created all these additional bank reserves to free up balance sheet capacity to give the banks ability to, to create more loans. That's the bottom line. And instead of the banking system going out in the real economy and creating loans to start businesses or just for productive uh, things, what they did is they just created loans to buy for financial institutions, other financial institutions and hedge funds to go in and buy financial assets and create derivatives. So why did they do that? It's not that they're just greedy and they're, I mean, they may be, but who isn't greedy, right? I mean, it's to find someone that's completely benevolent or isn't putting their self and their family first and foremost, you know, <laughs> uh, everyone is, is, is in that uh, camp at the end of the day. Right. So, so my point though, is why were they doing this? Because they thought there was a Fed put. So what that means is they thought the Fed was going to backstop the market. So th there's an asymmetric bet. If you own Wells Fargo, if you own JP Morgan, and your option is to extend a loan where your upside, let's say, is 50%, and your downside is 5%. Let's say that's option A. Option B is to an extend, extend a loan into the real economy, let's say to entrepreneur XYZ, where your upside is 50% and your downside is 50%. It's a no-brainer. You're going to do the loan where your upside's 50 and your downside's 5. So the Fed set up this artificial structure really with the financial economy 
where it incentivized these banks that had additional balance sheet capacity because the Fed created additional bank reserves. It incentivized them to go into financial assets and create even bigger bubbles than we have before. And that's why we went from a ho- we went from a dot com bubble to a housing bubble to now we're in an everything bubble. And that's why if the banking system would have taken the excess balance sheet capacity and created consumer loans, then you would have seen more currency units circulating in the real economy, chasing the same amount or fewer goods and services, Mm -hmm. which would have produced the extremely high inflation that people like Bob Murphy were predicting. That makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. So there really wasn't that circulation. There was that injection in terms of the balance sheet. That injection did not result in an equal injection of cash and transaction volume, for example, between consumer products, which is really where you get that increase in price. So the next step to this, though, is that there's a lot of people, and I'm very much a philosophical libertarian and a proponent of sound money, and in that camp, you hear when dollars get printed, or I should say more accurately, those reserve notes like you mentioned, they start to ramp up that whole process. We start to shout, oh, the dollar is trashed. The dollar is going to zero. Get ready for this big moment. And there's one thing I really don't like. It's when people say the exact opposite of the truth. It makes me crazy, especially when it comes to people that I have a lot of respect for. So (laughs) what you really see when you see a lot of these reserve notes being created is the opposite of that. You actually see a flight to the dollar. There's an inverse. It's the opposite of the dollar being trash. You see people jumping on buying a lot of dollars and strengthening the dollar, for example, when because those reserve notes are being created because there's a lot of fear in the marketplace. Right. So – First of all, before I move to the next step, what are your thoughts on that kind of dynamic there? Is that align with your view of how things have played out so far? As far as the dollar being a kind of a flight to safety, exactly. regardless of how much they're increasing base money, which are these exactly. bank reserves we are talking about, or even maybe M2, which would be broad money. So I think you have to look at the dollar as two completely separate currencies. I'd, I'd even give it a different name. So the dollar, as it exists outside of the United States, we'll call it the international dollar versus the domestic dollar. They're two completely separate supply-demand components there, or supply-demand equations. And you can have CPI increase in the United States. You can have your groceries go up. You can have your health care go up, your rent go up. The asset prices in the United States can go up, while at the same time, the, the dollar, if you look at the DXY, which is really just comparing it to the euro, could be appreciating in value. So how does that work? How can the dollar appreciate in value at, on the DXY and depreciate in value relative to local goods and services? Well, it's because you have to ask the, the dollar compared to what, right? So on the DXY, when you say the dollar is getting strong, that's what most people look at. It's really just getting strong in relationship to the euro or to a basket of other currencies. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's getting strong compared to your groceries. And you can see this. If you look at CPI, of course, what the government will admit to, (laughs) I think CPI runs a lot higher than they'll admit to. But even look at a chart, like a Fred chart of CPI and compare that to the DXY. There's no relationship whatsoever. CPI can be going up. The DXY can be going up at the same time. Sometimes they're the same. Sometimes they're different. There, there's really, and then you you layer over a chart of asset prices, and you can have asset prices going down while inflation is going up. The 1970s were a fantastic example of that. If you look at 72 to 74, we're in a bear market in the United States and stocks. If my memory serves me right, the market went down by about 50 percent, and this is in the 1970s. So asset prices are tanking or deflating, if you want to use that word, massive deflation in asset prices, while at the same time, the CPI is going through the roof and the dollar is plummeting against other currencies. There are certain currencies. So you always have to say, well, you know, inflation, deflation, it's a very nuanced question. And the reason is because there's just completely different supply-demand dynamics inside and outside the United States. 
And there's really not a great transfer mechanism for these currency units, for dollars, to get outside of the domestic economy. I mean, if you think about it, the only way that dollars typically get outside of an economy is if you just travel and maybe you need to exchange some dollars for some Colombian pesos if you go down to Colombia, or if there's a, um, what's going to create more is a, is a trade deficit. And mm-hmm. we, we definitely do that. So you're supplying a lot of these dollars as a result of a, a trade deficit. But uh, those are really the only two transfer mechanisms outside of doing something extreme like uh, the Fed creating dollar swap lines or, or maybe the, the New York Fed taking and, and printing up bank reserves to buy dollars or sell dollars on the open market. That, that's the way it happens. So that's why you can have, we could have like 1970s type of inflation in the United States, while at the same time, the dollar could be appreciating against the euro or a basket of other currencies because of all the dollar denominated debt outside of the U.S. creating this constant demand regardless of the supply. And it's like a leaky bucket where you you can pour water in it and all the water doesn't come out at one time. It just barely comes out in streams. And that's what could happen if the Fed, as an example, or the Treasury starts spending money into the domestic economy. It it doesn't just all at once go out into the international economy to, to really decrease the demand for those dollars. You see, so there's a lot of moving parts there, to say the least. Yeah, and I think you brought up a really important point regarding something that we don't contemplate frequently, which is the combination of you know, a strong dollar and uh, increasing prices or even inflation, for example. It's, it's very interesting. Um, so let's talk really quickly about what you mentioned about the, the foreign denominated debt, which is mostly in dollars. First of all, why are other countries buying this? I mean, you mentioned that there seems to be a very strong demand for these dollars. Looking at the U.S. balance sheet, for example, some people would say, why would that be the case? Um, what are your thoughts there? Well, it goes back to 2011 or so. I, I should have that chart memorized. But about 2011, the dollar was down maybe 70, 75 on the DXY. So super, super cheap compared to even now, the dollar has gone down substantially. And I think it's gone from maybe 100 down to 92. So you think back to, let's call it 2011, it's down at 75. And also the Fed has artificially dropped interest rates. So a foreign country or a foreign corporation could borrow all of these dollars and get them at a super, super cheap interest rate. So, and not only that, not only was the interest rate on the dollar domestically cheap, but for the foreign corporations, it would be a lot cheaper than borrowing in their own currency because investors see the dollar as, as having less currency risk than maybe their local currency called the Colombian peso or the Turkish lira, right? So if you're this corporation that needs a $100 million loan, you could get that loan in pesos for, let's say, 12%, or you could get it denominated in dollars for 3%. So what are you going to do? You take it and you load up on the 3% debt thinking that, oh my gosh, the dollar is going to keep going down. You know, we're all human beings and we have recency bias Yep. and countries and big corporations are no different. They see the dollar go from 90 down to 75 and they just think it's going to keep on going down to zero. So they're thinking to themselves, I can get this super cheap dollar debt right now for call it 3% compared to my local currency at 12%. And If the dollar continues to go down, which everyone knows it will, then I can pay the debt back with cheaper dollars than I borrowed at the beginning. So it's a transfer Mm -hmm. of wealth from the lender to the borrower, right? Yeah, You know that just from 30-year fixed rate debt. It's the exact same thing. You're getting paid to short the dollar. (laughs) So that's why they just loaded up on all of this debt. You know, it's like a buffet of debt where they're just (laughs) gorging themselves. Now, we know what happened. Instead of the dollar going down further, what did it do? It went up and up and up and up. And all of a sudden, the dollar's back up, let's say, at at 100. And these countries are screwed. They have just painted themselves into a corner because they took on all this dollar debt. But now the dollar's worth a lot more. It's appreciated in value relative to their own currency. But you see, their cash flows are mostly in their own currency. 
Mm. So that means the burden of that debt became even greater. Mm -hmm. And so they've got to try to sell their own currency to get these dollars. And they've got to sell more and more and more of their currency, which increases the supply in the international markets. And therefore, if that increases the supply, then relative to the dollar, their currency depreciates, the dollar appreciates in value. Yeah, even further, yeah. exacerbating the problem. And some of these countries, they may not have the best economic situation anyway. I mean, there's a reason they were taking this bet in the first place. What does this pressure result in? Like, how do you see this playing out for them? And then also, what are the implications for the United States? There's no, I mean, all I can do is, is give you, I can explain things but it's almost impossible for me to give a prediction because there are so many cross currents. I mean, there's a lot of cross currents just when you're talking about inflation and deflation domestically in the United States. But when you start layering on all of these factors that we just talked about, uh, and then we haven't even talked about the dollar denominated assets that these countries and corporations have, you see? So you've got to look at the balance sheet of each individual corporation or a foreign entity in each individual country and then come to a conclusion and then put them all together and try to attach some probabilities as to how it plays out. And I'm not so, smart enough to do that. <laughs> yeah, we won't hold you to it. We've already talked about some things that are a little bit counterintuitive. Some people we both have a lot of respect for that given this set of circumstances, maybe they had an incorrect view of how things would play out or maybe they had a correct view. It's just that there was other circumstances that they didn't account for. So um, we won't circle back on this in three years and go, ha ha, we got him, we tricked him. So, But we'd yeah, love no, to no. hear the explanations. Yeah, I think it's a timing issue because whether you're talking to Brent Johnson, Jim Rickards, Peter Schiff, uh, Lacey Hunt, Luke Groman, uh, Lynn Alden, who's my partner in a, a product I have. Long term, they're all dollar bears. All of them. All of them. You know, you give them a 10-year time horizon, you say, is the dollar going to be lower or higher in 10 years, especially relative to consumer goods? And like, oh, dollar's going to be lower. Dollar's going to be lower. It's just what happens in the interim. So guys like Brent and Lacey and maybe uh, Jeff Snyder, would say that the dollar is going up over the next maybe caught year, two years. But then at some point, the, the chickens have to come home to roost. So I think it really is, is a matter of your, your time horizon. Now, I think that if we just look at the domestic economy and focus on inflation there, not with asset prices, but just with consumer prices, the stuff that you and I buy on a, on a daily basis, I think we are going to see a stagflationary type of environment. And those of your listeners who might not know the definition, that's where you have high consumer price inflation, while at the same time, you have high unemployment. Because several reasons. Number one, I think when the dust settles from what we're experiencing right now with the virus, that a lot of these businesses aren't coming back. And, you know, I think the government's going to continue to throw out stimulus checks and to do infrastructure spending and maybe UBI, call it helicopter money. But the bottom line is a lot of the supply that we had in the United States of goods and services is not going to come back online for a long, long time. So that means high unemployment for an extended period. Even if we could just, let's just say that we had a vaccine tomorrow uh, that would just bam, or let's say it just disappears tomorrow. It doesn't mean that the U.S. economy would go right back to 100% output of what we had prior to, let's say, January. It doesn't work that way. A lot of those businesses aren't coming back. A lot of those jobs are not coming back. The only way they're going to come back is when we start new businesses and have new opportunities. And I think that's going to be quite constricted moving forward because I think the amount of regulation that we're going to have because of not only the president, you know, the, the election, but because of what's going on with the virus, that we're going to have a lot of rules and regulations. There's going to be a lot of liabilities. There's going to be a lot of burdens on businesses that just didn't exist before. And so, in my opinion, we're going to have a lot fewer businesses started. I mean, it just kind of makes sense, right? Who would want to start a business right now or a new restaurant or a new travel agency in what we're dealing with? Probably not too many people. So that creates high employment. So where do you get the high inflation rate if you have a lot of that demand destruction, which is kind of implicitly what I was just talking about? So then the government comes in with their their 
monetizing the or the Fed is monetizing the government deficits. So what happens in the the scenario we talked about earlier is that the Fed creating bank reserves just stays within the, the bank reserve accounts held at the Fed for the primary dealer banks and the banks under the, the Fed's umbrella. And the transfer mechanism is the commercial banking system. But there's a way around that, a couple ways. But the main way around that is if the government issues a treasury, and that it's, it's kind of a shell game, but basically the Fed buys it with newly printed or created bank reserves. And then that goes into the treasury's account at the Fed called the TGA. And then the treasury, let's say, spends that into the real economy uh, through, let's say, a stimulus check to the average Joe. Well, the average Joe is going to take that stimulus check and deposit it into their bank account within the commercial banking system. So now what you've done is you've created the additional bank reserves or the additional base money but you've also created additional broad money, that there was a transfer mechanism, just like a bank creating an additional loan. So what Dr. Lacey Hunt said, the way he says it, is you've, you've taken bank reserves and turned them into legal tender. Hmm. Now, technically, that's against the Federal Reserve Act. It prohibits the Fed from, let's say, paying the bills or injecting money directly into the economy, creating additional bank liability, or an easier way to say it, additional deposits in the commercial banking system. So currency units that are circulating within the economy, chasing those goods and services. It, and that's, that's for, there's a reason for that, right? <laughs> it, I mean, no matter how malicious you want to think the people that drafted the Federal Reserve Act were or weren't, I mean, that's a completely other topic. The bottom line is when it was written in 1913 or 1912, I'm assuming it was written before the Fed was, was set up, but when it was written, it was uh, very specific that there were only certain things that the Fed could buy, and that was mainly U.S. Treasuries. And that's the main reason for that is because they didn't want all this, the Fed having direct control over M2 money supply. And so I think that with what's happened in March and since then, with the Fed now buying you know, junk corporate debt. Just about to bring that up. Buying high yield. And it's just a shell, you know, it's just a smoke and mirrors thing where they're setting up these special purpose vehicles. It, it's completely against the Federal Reserve Act. So my point is, if they're willing to ignore the Federal Reserve Act, and no one even cares, like no one's even talking about this. Like, did anyone on the, on CNBC or Bloomberg, when the Fed came out with these four-letter and all these four-letter and five-letter alphabet soup programs, did any of them say, wait a minute, the Fed can't do that. That's totally against the law. That's against the Federal Reserve Act. No, the, the only, only thing they said was, oh, how good. Well it would work. Yeah, I'm exactly. sorry, what was that? The only thing they said was, oh, good. Or maybe it shouldn't be $3 trillion, it should be $2 trillion. That was the extent of the conversation. Exactly, right. So if they're going to ignore that, I think they'll just ignore it in the future. And if you go back to March, I, I'm not sure if you recall this, but I'm, maybe some of your listeners will. The Fed had a meeting set up for a Wednesday, and that was when they were going to determine what they're going to do with interest rates. And they actually had an emergency meeting the, the Sunday before, where they dropped interest rates, uh, 100 basis points, down to zero. And it was just this emergency measure. And they came out and said that they were going to commit to doing a trillion dollars a day in repo. Not that they're going to do it, but th and they never did. But they were committing to that. And they said that we're going to do QE infinity. We're going to do all these things. And when the market opened up on Monday, for the first three or four hours, it went up. But then it completely tanked. I mean, it was down like a thousand points the day after the Fed came out with all these monetary bazookas, let's call them. And what happened is the market started to go back up only days after when the government came in and started talking about fiscal spending. So my point here is I think we've gone from a Fed put or a Fed backstop to the market to a government backstop of the market. And why that's important is because when the Fed backstops the market through QE, it just creates this base money. But when the government backstops the market, now we're not only creating more base money, which is just like QE, 
it gives more balance sheet capacity to the primary dealer banks, but also they're creating more broad money to people that will spend it and get the velocity of the money circulating at a higher rate. And when you add that to what I think will happen moving forward, and that's that uh, the Fed will probably directly send checks to people via like an app on their phone. And that's when, going back to Lacey Hunt, that's when the Fed is, is starting to pay the bills. And regardless of the, well, I'm not going to say this because I don't want to put words in their mouth, but from a lot of the experts that are even on the deflation side right now, that's the line in the sand for them. Mm. Meaning that as long as the Fed is, quote unquote, abiding by the Federal Reserve Act, which I would argue that they're already not, that we're going to see deflation because that's the natural course that the economy wants. That's the natural direction for the economy because we're so over indebted. And that, that's what should happen. We should go into a deflationary debt spiral. But their line in the sand is if the Fed starts spending money directly into the real economy to where now they're not only manipulating base money, but also broad money, then it's all bets are off. Then most of those guys on the, on the deflation side go right over to the, the inflation side, if not hyperinflation. So my point is, I think the Fed is going to completely ignore the Federal Reserve Act and the next down leg that we have in the market, whenever we get that, they're going to come in and they're going to inject, it's going to go, whether it's infrastructure spending or who knows what it'll be, but they're going to find a way to manipulate the money supply to get the inflation up to satisfy, you know, let's remember that the government is 26 trillion in debt. And the only way out of that is to inflate the debt away or default. So they have to have inflation to lower the debt burden. And so the, the Fed's going to, you know, crank that dial with maybe this app. And that's where you get consumer price inflation increasing because money supply is increasing, velocity is increasing, and the supply of goods and services is going down while at the same time, unemployment remains very high. And that's why my base case, and there's no certainties, and I'm just an amateur, I, I'm not a professional at all, but my base case is that we have that stagflation. I think that was a very brilliant explanation of that. And I like the fact that you kind of set the stage with some of the thought leaders that are in different camps. But, and I also like the fact that we set the stage in this particular conversation with the foundations before we jumped into that, because I think that is actually going to be very compelling to a lot of listeners. Now, the next question after that, of course, is how do you see this playing out from an investment perspective? Given your view on this, what are you finding compelling in the world of investments? What are you more bearish on? What are your thoughts there? I'm bearish financial assets. I'm bullish commodities and hard assets. But let, let me preface that by saying that my main philosophy as an investor and it's not mine, it's Jim Rogers and or maybe going back to Benjamin Graham or something, but you're buying when things are cheap and you're selling them when they're expensive. So if you just say, well, George likes hard assets, therefore I'm going to buy this uh, condo in New York City or I'm going to buy this condo in downtown LA. No, 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 no. That's not what George is saying. <laughs> that, that's not what I'm saying. Now, I like real estate because I, I think it's a great asset to have regardless of the environment, but especially in a stagflationary environment. But you've got to be selective. Real estate is very local. And one of the benefits we have as real estate investors is it's a very inefficient market. And a lot of people say, well, George, how can you be bearish on the US market in general, but kind of be bullish in certain areas? I said, because if you're good at buying and because the market is so inefficient, if you can get a seller in a good neighborhood, in areas that I like, and I like these markets that I refer to them as linear markets. It's a term I got from my good buddy, Jason Hartman. But if you're in one of these linear markets with a fantastic uh, grade A property, and you can get that seller to sell to you at a 2012 price, why would you not buy it? It's cheap. Who cares where the market is? You're getting a 12% return on that money with, with no leverage. And that doesn't even include the, you know, if you can leverage it with a 30 year fixed rate loan. So then you're taking that positive cash flow, you're putting it in your pocket and you're shorting the dollar at the same time because you're paying that debt back with cheaper dollars. So I, I want to be very clear there with real estate that it's, it's very nuanced 
although I would put it into that category. And I love real estate all over, not just in the United States, but in Colombia. You know, another place I'm looking right now, uh, well, not as we speak, I'm in St. Bart's until kind of the, the craziness of the virus is over. But uh, when this is in the rear view mirror, I'm really looking at Puerto Rico because it's one of the only dollar denominated markets right now where prices have been steadily going down for years. Uh, you know, they got, they had their country basically went bankrupt. They had the hurricane that just wiped them out. And now they're just getting crushed by COVID. And so you can get maybe a 1% RV ratio with a uh, property there, you know, right on the beach, right in Condado. Maybe you could get an even higher return than 1% if you do an Airbnb, but it's still denominated in dollars where most of the markets in the United States are what I would consider in a bubble, unless, unless you find a motivated seller that can sell to you at a cheap price. So, okay, so that's real estate. Now on the commodities side, if you look at uh, things like agriculture, coal, uranium, oil, all these things that most people don't like right now, <laughs> or, or maybe gold, silver, the miners. Going back 120 years, they're at all time lows against financial assets or against the S&P 500 more specifically. So again, I like buying stuff when it's low and selling it when it's high. And that is the only thing that I can find that's not, not only is it not a bubble, but it's very cheap. So how do you play that? You can't go out and buy barrels of oil or, or a bag of uranium. I, I, <laughs> I don't know what uranium comes in. Maybe it's not a bag. Of, it might be a little too volatile for that. But however you would buy uranium, you can't store it in your garage. So you just look at producers and hopefully you can get some that, that throw off a dividend. As far as equities or bonds debt, I think there's some interesting opportunities, but they're all outside of the United States. Yeah, really fascinating. And I appreciate you giving the picks because sometimes it's challenging to take that big picture theory and thesis and turn it into something that can actually help us grow and protect well. So I appreciate you going through that. Sure. Um, last question, and then we'll, we'll jump off because I want to be respectful of the time. What does this recovery slash recession slash potential depression look like over the next three or five years compared to, let's say, 2009? Boy, that's a good question. Compared to 2009, I think. Unemployment's going to be higher. I, and I'm just trying to think of just, there's a lot of things that would be different, but what the, the average person would notice in their everyday lives. I think you're going to have more restrictions. You're going to have more regulations. You're going to have higher unemployment. You're going to have higher taxes, um, potentially property taxes. I mean, that's, I know that sucks as real estate investors, but I think it's something we need to be cognizant of, especially if we live in states or cities where their pension funds are bust. And really the only option for them is to increase property taxes. I think you're, you're going to see consumer price inflation continuing to go up. I think you're going to see social unrest continue to get much, much worse because the only if the Fed steps in and tries to, quote unquote, solve this problem, the only thing they're going to do is make it worse because the only thing they can do is create bank reserves. And if they do inject money into the real economy, at some point, that'll bring on substantial inflation. And then once the inflation genie gets out of the bottle, that just makes everyone's lives miserable, not just the, you know, the producers or not just the rich, but the middle class and poor as well, even though they might be getting some form of uh, UBI. UBI doesn't really do anything when all it does is buy you a loaf of bread. Right. So they're not transferring them purchasing power. They're transferring them currency units. And then there's a big, big, big difference there. So I think that's kind of how I see it playing out. And I think my biggest concern is the social unrest because that could exacerbate every other problem exponentially. And what we've seen in the United States over the past few months, let's say, is something that I, I never thought I would ever see, ever, in the United States. And I'm someone that, that many have uh, accused of wearing a tinfoil hat, maybe more than I should. And uh, so I just don't see how that resolves itself, especially when a lot of those uh, riots and looting and social unrest is not really about what it seems like on the surface, but it's more about kind of a movement towards Marxism and, and not just socialism, but, but Marxism. 
and that the Marxists feel as though we're in something they call late stage capitalism. And that really concerns me and worries me quite a bit. I see one big difference is I think in 2008, 2009, we saw a lot of capital flight into the United States. And although that may happen initially, because that's kind of people's Pavlovian response, I think over the three, five-year time horizon, you'll see a capital fleeing the United States because capital is always going to go where it's treated best. (laughs) And uh, I don't think capital is going to be treated very well in the U.S. over the next few years. So that's kind of the differences uh, that I can think of right off the top of my head. Yeah, I appreciate the kind of quasi-speculation and the justification there. Really, really an excellent and very engaging conversation. Definitely going to go back and listen to this again. You touched on one thing I wanted to circle back on, which is just the inertia of the economy. Even if there is a vaccine, even if there is no more cases, the stopping that inertia creates a lot of things, one of which is just the emotional component of dealing with closing down your own business. It yeah. takes people a second to take their time, dust themselves off, go back to it. And now in a new environment where there's this new button, which the bu- uh, government can push, which says nobody can come to your business. Mm-hmm. It's uh, adding a completely new paradigm of risk during the time at which entrepreneurs are least likely to take on risk. So very, very interesting. I really appreciate it. Before we jump off though, let the listeners know how they can find more about you, your YouTube videos and your website. Sure. They can just go to my YouTube channel or they can find me on Twitter or at georgegammon.com. Uh, the, the YouTube channel is just my name. My Twitter account is my name. And the spelling of Gammon is G-A-M-M-O-N. And uh, first name is just a typical spelling. Although many of my family members call me Jorge, uh, George is still spelled with a G. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, George, really appreciate it. We'll have you on in a couple months again. Awesome. Thank you. All right, listeners, thanks for checking out the episode. As always, the contact information for our guest will be available in the show notes page, which is hosted on SoundCloud, iTunes, and Stitcher. Don't forget, if you want access to some of the free goodies that I'm talking about at the beginning of these episodes, like free ebooks, weekly investor emails, and articles about some of the most important investment related topics, make sure that you have created an account with CFC because this stuff is automatically available. You can do this by going to cashflowconnections.com and signing up as an accredited investor. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hunterthompson at cashflowconnections.com. Thanks again. 